I am delighted to in- introduce our esteemed guest for today's episode, Dr. Ariel Ingonde from Wilkent University, an accomplished and renowned mathematical physicist and a mathematician. Dr. Gonde specializes in the field of operator theory, a branch of fun- sh- functional analysis which involves the study of linear operators on space of functions. In addition to his scholarly work on operator theory, Dr. Gondea has displayed a wide-ranging curiosity that extends into quantum mechanics. His research here, particularly in the realm of Hilbert spaces, is profoundly influenced by the mathematical formalisms in quantum theory. This fascinating interplay between mathematics and physics has not only enriched his work, but also fostered a deep appreciation for the interconnectedness of these disciplines in his approach. Now let's hear from Dr. Gondé himself as we delve into these topics and more. I give you Dr. Aurelien Gondé. Thank you for the invitation. Sure. So let's start. Uh, when did your fascination with mathematics start? What was different for you about it from other fields? Uh, it started sometimes while I was a high school student. Actually, um, I'm a very curious person, scientifically. And I want to learn everything. When I was uh, in the school, in the high school, I was learning everything. I was never, never satisfied with how much I learned. And uh, gradually I, um, I had my interest into sciences and mathematics. And for a while uh, I was very much interested in chemistry, in physics, in biology. But slowly mathematics became uh, somehow uh, my favorite uh, topics. But I had to put this in a little bit more perspective. You know, I was born in a communist country, sure. and there was a time of communism, and uh, since I am very curious, as a student, I was asking many questions. Sure. And unfortunately, some of my teachers were a little bit um, not happy with the questions I was asking. But only in the class of mathematics, nobody told me that this question is not right. So eventually, I was <laughs> directed to mathematics in this way. Okay. So, do you still think about other fields like physics, biology, chemistry? Do, do you still have an interest in them? Do you still do your research? Yes. Uh, uh, part of my research is in mathematical physics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started some years ago a collaboration with a specialist in social sciences. Uh, some years ago, I started um, a collaboration with a specialist in Birkant University in, uh, in education sciences, and I'm interested in many other things. Uh, so about mathematics, you said you were interested in it from high school. What was the most important thing? Is it your teachers or is it the books, the whatever it was? in your time available? Yeah, unfortunately I I didn't have that uh, teachers that you can imagine that they were so wonderful. They were decent but not extraordinary. But in in my country, in Romania, because I'm coming from that country, there is a very long tradition on uh, mathematics for um, 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 students in secondary grade and in high school. We have a a journal, which is, I think, 150 years old. It's called Gazeta Mathematica, Mathematical Gazette, where they have a lot of questions that students can, and then they are writing solutions. But what actually attracted me and helped me a lot were not quite the questions, but the articles in which they explain mathematics. And that was really wonderful. That was one thing. And there was another thing, when I was in the high school, um, 
my coordinator uh, teacher, every class had a coordinator teacher, she was actually uh, teaching uh, literature, which I also was very interested at the time. But because somehow I was a kind of star in the high school, you know, this mathematical competition, uh, these kind of things, she made a present, a treatise in two volumes uh, on mathematical analysis. And I was in the, in the second grade. I didn't know yet what analysis is, and I started by myself, and that actually changed my life. So you didn't understand much when starting the arts, reading the articles and reading the things you mentioned. How did that jump happen? Like, how much time did it take? How how difficult was it for you? Of course, it was difficult because that two volume. Uh, Mathematical analysis was meant for uh, students in the university. Yeah. But, um, okay, I managed to learn somehow pretty well the first volume, but the second one was more difficult. But that was really uh, that triggered my, uh, my interest into mathematics. So, not only mathematics, but in analysis, because I am specialized in mathematical analysis. So, what did you struggle most in your undergrad years, after high school, graduate years, and afterwards, while you are trying to dive deep in the sea of mathematical universes, mathematical analysis? Um, well, in the university, I was blessed with extraordinarily good professors. And we had uh, one of them, he actually taught us, uh, in, in, my, in my country, Mathematical analysis is studied in the first uh, year, in the first grade, because we learn somehow what uh, you know as calculus in the high school. So it's a little bit um, faster program. And when he saw some, uh, some of our, our interested in analysis, he organized a study seminar with undergraduate students, and he told us what is necessary in order to be introduced into functional analysis and operator theory, and these kind of things, and this is how I was, I, I started being interested and uh, with work in that point. I was an undergraduate student. So starting with that was difficult for you the most? Uh, it yeah. was challenging. Yeah. It was challenging and um, the education level in, in that university, because Romania has a French system of education, is very tough. Very strict. But um, I meant I was I was on the top in the, in the class. Cool, very cool. So as as far as I know, that may not be true. But you didn't start first in academia. You uh, is that correct? First of all, yes, because at that time in the communist time, nobody was accepted into academia directly after graduation, whatever. So I spent two years in a computing center, programming in Fortran. Wow. Okay. But it was a nice experience, yeah. Uh, so how did you start in being interested in academia and shifting to academia after that? Actually, um, um, after getting my master, um, it was not possible to go into, uh, to be accepted into the PhD program because the communist time was crazy. But that's why I, I, I obtained my PhD a little bit uh, later. So, um, since I was interested in operator theory and functional analysis, and I already had some publications as an undergraduate student, uh, I was remarked by um, uh, mathematicians from the Institute of Mathematics of the Romanian Academy. And um, they somehow uh, uh, selecting us. So, um, how did your environment take it? Since uh, I don't think people would support that kind of an idea that you become a mathematician, you go to the academia at that time, right? You mean uh, the family or...? The family, your friends. Oh, uh, my family was okay. Uh, my father was a military officer. He wanted me to have a military career, but I said no. 
and he understood, and he supported me. But because I had shown my mathematical talent during the high school, it was somehow clear that I'm going in that direction. So, what was your expectation when you decided to pursue your work in academia? And how different was it from your expectation before starting? The experience was wonderful because, uh, you know, uh, in that time in Romania, there were basically five big universities. Okay, imagine a country of 20 million having only five universities. So uh, the university education was very elitist. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I was very happy to have wonderful professors and to have wonderful colleagues. So many of my colleagues went into academia after that. And um, what was actually even more than that, it was the atmosphere, uh, challenging, uh, exchanging ideas, it was wonderful. As far as I know, that part is kind of difficult in mathematics because you specialize in very different fields. You get many less citations from other people. How, how long is it for you in mathematics? Yeah, uh, if you are talking about uh, the life of a researcher in mathematics, yes. it is, it's different. But all the mathematicians are judged according to the same rules. Okay, we don't publish that much. Getting an article published may take years. Sure. We don't get as many citations, but for the domain, we have different standards. So it's not, it's not quite a problem. Yeah, yeah definitely, but don't, isn't it still kind of lonely? Because uh, there are probably like at most a hundred people that work and specialize in your field. And yeah, that's correct. Yeah, compared to the other fields, it's like much less. And probably you are communicating not with the hundred of them, at most thirty of them maybe. Uh, actually, not quite like that because the Institute of Mathematics in which I was working for, I, I actually worked there for my half of my career, 20 years. Um, it, it is an elite institute. The scientific level is even higher than in the university. And uh, we, had, um, we had our colleagues, all the colleagues that directed us, that explained to us what we had to do. So participating into conferences, national or international, uh, having good publications um, as a level of international, not local, it was uh, very good. So uh, it was okay. I didn't, I didn't feel, if I understand correctly your question, I didn't feel any shock about that. Okay. okay. Um, so let's say we give you a chance to change anything in the academia. What would you do? Uh, academia is a quite a large uh, concept. Um, it includes universities, it includes research institutes. So I spend half of my life in the research institute, I spend the other half in the university. And probably, I don't know if I'm um, ahead with one of your questions, why I came here in Birkett. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry for no, no, spoiling your question. <laughs> But uh, my problem was the following. Uh, the life of a researcher is a little bit frustrating. Because you, you can work on a project for one year, and at the end of the year you discover that your idea was not good enough, and you have nothing. But if you combine research with teaching, every day you have a reward. You are looking at the class, you are explaining some things, and at some moment you, have a, you see a glitter in, 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 in the eyes of a student. That makes my day. Yeah, yeah. But as a researcher, it's more frustrating. Uh, you, you, you mentioned students, so I will just ask this. People dislike mathematics a lot, so um, why do you think that is? And how do you, do you have any idea how to solve that? Like, it, it's, it seems to be a problem. Yeah, it is a difficult problem. Uh, mathematics is difficult because it's very abstract. 
I have, I'm teaching students from our department. I'm teaching students from the science faculty. I'm teaching students uh, from engineering uh, or some other departments. And they have a different perspective. Uh, but uh, my, uh, my philosophy of uh, uh, seeing mathematics uh, is uh, like that. There is place for everybody. It depends how much mathematics you need and how much mathematics you want to learn. I have in my, uh, uh, in my course on advanced calculus, which is dedicated to students in mathematics, I have a small group of 10 students. They are always eager to learn more, and they are challenging me, and this is wonderful. Okay, there's another part of the class, they are not that much interesting. They find mathematics very difficult. So imagine that I have to give something to everybody, and this is challenging. You are right. For, for sure. Yeah. Like, um, so for, for those students specifically, what would you suggest them to do? Like, how can they become, how can they see mathematics not as difficult, but a fun thing to do? Um, it's difficult to do that, and I don't believe in uh, the idea of mathematics for everybody, because it's not true. It depends very much how much mathematics you want to learn, how much mathematics you need. And there's a whole range of things. For the students that want to have just an um, introduction to mathematics, I'm usually sympathetic because I understand that their background is weaker and they struggle with it. So what I'm doing, usually I'm saying, okay, this is a minimal level. I want you to understand this concept. I want you to, wanna, to, to uh, make sure that you know how to apply some of the things, and this is sufficient. For the others, there is more challenging. Reasoning questions, more creativity. You would be surprised how much creativity we need the problems that have been solved always come with some creativity. So another question might be how how much of creativity is needed in mathematics? You, you said a lot, but compared to computation, computation strengths, where do you put creativity? Uh, if you want to be a professional mathematician, you should be very creative. There is a nice uh, story about David Hilbert. He was one of the most beautiful mathematical minds. And uh, uh, working on the street, he met a young guy. And the young guy was very polite. He said, you know, I was your student. And then uh, David Hilbert asked, uh, what happened to you? OK, um, I found uh, mathematics not that interesting, so now I am a, a poet. David Hilbert said, OK, I remember you. You didn't show too much creativity. So in mathematics, creativity is even more difficult than in others because you, have to, you are confined by very strict rules. If you are a poet, OK, we all love, like poems, uh, you can have a lot of freedom. But in mathematics, it's not like that. So. Which, which poets do you like most? Okay, so I have my uh, ruling and favorite uh, poet. One uh, was a mathematician. He was actually a famous mathematician, a geometer, Dan Barbinian. But he's also one of the, our best uh, poets. He, he used a different name, John Barbo. And he has actually written a lot of poems that you cannot understand if you don't if you are not a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. Did you, did you ever consider writing one? Yeah, I am. Did you? Yes, I am. Cool. I have many, many other things I'm doing. Do, do you publish them? Uh, not Where yet. Are not yet. Are you considering it? Yes, I'm considering for the future, when I will retire. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that though? Why? Because I'm writing very, uh, very slowly. Uh, I'm writing uh, literature or poems uh, like I'm doing mathematics. So I write, I polish, I go over them all over and over again, I change, I do things. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So 
I know that you teach two courses, one of them is, as you said, advanced calculus. And I, I also hear that students like you very much, not a lot of mathematicians are this much like. So what, what do you try to do differently than you think other professors? Um, I, I said a little bit about that. So the problem with this class is that it's heterogeneous. There are three groups of students, and I'm trying to give something to everybody. But my main concern is about the students that want to become mathematicians. And I'm giving them the most I, uh, I can. But in addition to that, I'm giving them perspectives. Anytime I'm teaching about a concept or a theorem, I put this in perspective. I'm saying, OK, th this is connected with mechanics. This is connected with quantum mechanics. This is connected with topology. This is connected with PD. And in a few minutes, I'm explaining where this is going. So, um, a lot of students struggle in undergraduate years because they don't know how to adapt to academia, whether or not they should publish, whether or not they should do an internship with mathematicians. So, for a person who wants to be, become a mathematician, what would you suggest them do while in undergraduate years, what did you do? Uh, my advice for these students is to postpone specialization as late as possible. So my advice is try to learn as much diverse mathematics as you can, because this is your last chance. After that, when specializing, we don't have time to do that. So learn mathematical analysis, learn algebra, learn combinatorics, learn geometry, learn everything it's offered to you. And later, you can choose. But another outcome of this diverse, diverse um, education, mathematical education, is that in the future, you never know what kind of mathematics you are going to need. So you mentioned you had publications even in undergraduate years. Yeah. Right. Um, how, how did that work, you know? It's not, it's not very easy to do that in undergraduate. Yeah, in our system, um, we had a course which is called Diploma, which is similar to senior project that you have here. But it takes only, it takes one year. And because I already had this um, uh, experience, so I had a lot of uh, knowledge of uh, function analysis and operator theory. I went to the professor, uh, Jon Kolozara is his name. Um, he eventually was my PhD advisor as well. And I asked for a subject for my diploma work. And he has given me an article. Uh, he, he didn't expect something original. He only expected me to understand it and to make a presentation of it. But while reading that article, I realized that something is missing. And I went back to him and I asked, and he said, yes, you're right, it's missing. Can you think about uh, how to do it? And then I did, and my diploma work actually had an original result. And he said, you should publish it. So for undergraduates, um, how much time should be given to like, some, trying to create something? from the start or trying to fix some mathematical idea that they don't see fit? How much time did you spend on that? I was spending a lot of time. You see, the life of a, of a student uh, in mathematics that uh, really wants to have a, um, a research career um, is very difficult. So we have to spend a lot of time. So my social life was not that nice. Um, my girlfriend at that time, she was eventually my wife. She was always complaining about that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's very hard to balance that actually. How how, how do you do it? Well, you have to sacrifice. You have to make choices. Yeah. How how difficult is it for you even still? Um, it is difficult, but uh, after living so many years. Probably already realized that nothing important can be obtained without hard work. So, how how much do you care about 
being uh, remembered after because of your work that you did in academia? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that is a nice question. I don't know. Um, I have my publications, I have something like 80 publications, I have several books. Uh, but uh, if some of my results will be important for the future, that would be nice. But I think that in these, these 20 last years I am teaching in the university, many of my students actually will remember me. And you know what happens actually, sometimes I'm stumbling to some people. I, actually, I have a good memory, I recognize faces and given names. And they talk to me and uh, they have good memories about uh, and some of them are really thankful. I can tell you something uh, which is a little bit um, contradictory. Uh, some students that failed my course once, even twice, but eventually uh, they passed it. Um, they came to me after that and, and said, you know, Hojan, you somehow have, you have given me something that I didn't expect to get in this life. Because at the beginning, the student was saying, I was thinking that I will never be able to understand this material. It's talking about, it's talking about mathematical analysis. But after repeating the course, and after taking your advice, because I'm usually advising students how to study, what they have to do, I realized that I can do it. And that was wonderful, because these students realized that they, they can understand things that before they, thought they would never be able to understand. And this is a reward. For sure, for sure. But do you think there is a limit to how much you can understand? Like, can there be a, an idea that you can't understand with your level? Yes, and I'm, uh, I'm okay with this idea. But why, why do you think that is? Uh, because it seems intuitive that if you spend enough time on it, you will eventually understand. Yeah, but how long time do we have? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, there is uh, two things that we cannot avoid, death and IRS. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if you started your bachelor's again, this is your... What would you do differently from the start? Uh, thank you for this question. Definitely I would uh, try to be more efficient. I still have the feeling that I, I lost a lot of time and energy with things that were not important. Like what? Well, the problem is that um, looking backwards, the, there have been some, uh, some courses Unfortunately, they have been taught by not that good instructors. And I said, no, no, I don't like that. So I didn't study it that much. I had good grades, but I confess, I didn't understand it. So if I would uh, be a bachelor student again, I would be more serious in taking those courses. It should not depend on the quality of the instructor. Yeah, but still, do you think uh, there is something missing in undergraduate curriculums, something that needs to be taught more, or like, what, 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 what can be changed in mathematics? You mean, uh, because I have to compare my education in a completely different system and a long time ago with, with the current system. Is this the current, is this the kind of comparison you want me to, to make? You can do that, and also combining those and maybe creating an even better system, taking the best of both. Yeah, your question is difficult because you have to define what better means. And I, I'm not challenging with, with this question, I'm helping you with this question. Because the students, uh, you and your friends, uh, you are a different generation. You are the smartphone generation. We didn't have this uh, possibility to go into the virtual world. So imagine that we had to write by hand all our lectures in class because otherwise the 
there was no possibility. Now you have everything on the internet at two clicks. You have a lot of information. We have much less information. And I think that the problem with the students uh, of nowadays is that they don't know how to select what is important and what is less important. I, I see in curriculums that sometimes lectures focus on non-important things like uh, some specific questions that may not matter or uh, they ask about those things that don't matter like they just show computation power, not creativity, some problems like that or some problems that don't show understanding. Uh, how do you try to ask your questions in the exams? The questions I'm asking in my exams are usually... I'm talking about the course for students in mathematics because for the students in engineering is different. Uh, for the students in mathematics, um, I usually give five questions. Uh, two of them are more or less standard. They they require an ability to perform calculations, but okay, clever calculations, not stupid calculations. And then the others are um, gradually more challenging. And there is one question which requires some creativity from the students. That, that seems like a good approach. Uh, how, how can you understand that the students understood what failed in the exam? Like, um, well, how can you understand he approached creatively or how do you know that somebody understands by grading that, that that doesn't seem to be an easy task for, for anybody? Yeah, it is. Um, in, uh, in grading the questions, I always appreciate creativity. Even if the student didn't get the final the complete answer, if I see that they have a good idea, I'm giving a lot of uh, credit uh, for that. Um, the problem is with students that write one page and anything they write has to do with the question. This is a problem. And, and, and actually this shows that they didn't understand even the question. And while teaching and explaining uh, a lot of things to the students, do you know many students complain about this? They say, okay, this is mathematics, I don't have to memorize anything. But if they don't know the concepts, if they don't know the theorems, if they don't understand the ideas of proof, there is no way to do almost anything. They only want to calculate, to do computation. But you know, some, this is a question that I get many times from my students. Uh, especially not students from mathematics, but coming from other departments. They have the idea that mathematics is only quantitative. That means you have an equation, you have to solve it. No, this is only a part of mathematics. And the, and the larger part of mathematics is a qualitative part of mathematics. So, I, I agree with that definitely, and I will shift the topic a bit. Since we got into the online education nowadays, do you think that in the future the whole undergraduate curriculum can be taught in on, on can be taught with online education? Do you have an um, do you have an interesting approach about that? What do you think? Do you think it should be always lectures, students, or put online? So if you're talking about new technology, yeah. this can be very helpful. But in my opinion, I believe in the direct contact between the instructor and the student. Nothing replaces uh, this direct contact. Okay, maybe I'm old-fashioned, maybe um, I'm coming uh, from a different time, okay, yeah. I'm coming from the 20th century or 21st century. But I believe in, uh, in a 
uh, human direct human communication. And because I have a, I have some collaborators in social sciences, somehow they agree on this uh, issue. So technology for teaching is wonderful, but you have to combine uh, technology with direct. Clarify some things for me. For instance, people have also found that you know, success decreases with online education, at least for now. So you seem to be right. Um, I will shift the topic again one more time, but this one is a bit philosophical, and I think you might, you might like it. So, in the universe, where do you think the mathematics is? Some people think it's the language of the universe. Some people the way the universe is mathematics. Some think of it as a separate platonic universe. Which view would you like, subscribe to and why? Okay, this question, you're right, is philosophical. Yeah. Um, after uh, being a professional mathematician for so many years, um, my philosophy is um, like that. This universe is only a representation of a part of the mathematics. Mathematics, since you are a student in physics, mathematics is not a, a science in the, in the definition of Karl Popper, because it's not falsifiable. So, uh, Pythagoras theorem uh, is the same uh, for 2000, and it will be the same for eternity. But in physics, in other natural sciences, uh, everything is changed according to the advance of it. So, uh, okay, I can be a little bit arrogant and say that uh, mathematics is the only thing that is not changed at all in this universe. But there was a mathematician, a Romanian mathematician, he was even more arrogant. His name is uh, Grigory Moisek, he was an algebraist. And he said the following. <clears throat> There are only two types of mathematics, of uh, science, of sciences, I'm sorry. Uh, there are only two types of sciences, mathematized and mathematizable. So physics is the most mathematized science. Yeah. Chemistry is a lot. Biology now is in the course of mathematization. Yeah. Yeah. Social sciences are a lot of economy, uh, sociology, all these kind of things. So the mathematics, <laughs> this is a bad uh, thing. Imagine like it's a monster conquering this world. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to think of it that way, but maybe like, where, where, where do you find the unreason, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics? Like, what do you think about it? Eugen Wigner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it's not a surprise. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to my students many times, and I tell them, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this world with my uh, mathematical, mathematical eyeglasses, and I see mathematics everywhere. In your smartphone, in your computer, but not only that. In this table, uh, in the cars, in almost everything we do. The only thing is that you have to understand and you have to look in the right way. Of course, there is Galileo Galilei who said that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And uh, there is another guy, I forgot his name, uh, a citation from him. It's, uh, if you scratch anything, you're going to get mathematics. <laughs> yeah, this is really the case. Yes. We are, we are trying to explain something, and the only way to do that seems to be mathematics to begin with. But where do you you you, you said that the universe is just a representation of mathematical universe? So is it a separate thing on its own, or um, there, there is a connection with the universe with that? Is it separate or is it here? I, I can't seem to solve that on my own, so... Um, okay, it can be subjective, of course, because we are talking about philosophical ideas. 
Uh, I don't think that mathematics is in this universe. Mathematics is somewhere else. We have no idea where it is. But what is nice is there is only one uh, interface, and this is a human mind. So you think there is this universe, there is a mathematical universe, and mind is connecting them? Yeah, yeah. And a unique approach, I think. Okay, so you you definitely think that it is discovered and not invented mathematical ideas. Um, this is a difficult question. I, I understand what you are saying. Um, I don't exclude the, I don't exclude creativity in mathematics. I don't think that mathematics exists somewhere else and we only have to discover it. No, no, mathematics is changed, is enriched every time by, by all the research that we are doing. So before we go into the uh, more technical questions, I just want to ask, who is your favorite in all of history in mathematics? Oh, I have... Um, must have lots of favorites. Yeah, I have so a lot of. Yeah, too. I have a lot of uh, favorites. Um, but which, maybe the one of the unique ones, like probably everyone would say earlier. No, I think that that there have been um, a lot of extraordinary mathematicians, what we usually call beautiful minds, that contributed in different way. And you know what? Uh, I think that each professional mathematician is doing mathematics in, uh, in a very personal way. We have a saying in mathematics which somehow um, can be a little bit strange for you. Um, we say that we are not choosing the mathematical subjects. The subjects are choosing us. So, coming back to your question, um, I was blessed to have uh, one of my professors, his name is Dan Virgil Voiculescu, he is in the uh, University of uh, California at Berkeley. He's a creator of what is uh, now called uh, free probability. It's a huge domain. And uh, another professor I have, uh, Ciprian Foresh, he was my professor of function analysis. He worked simultaneously in three domains, operator theory, Navier-Stokes equations, and system theory. And he was extraordinarily successful in each of them. So he was uh, one of the most beautiful minds I met. I'm talking about mathematicians I met. If you look about the historical uh, figures, I'm uh, fascinated about uh, many of uh, them. Poincaré, Ali Poincaré, probably is one of the greatest, I think. David Hilbert uh, as well, but many, many others. I have a long list. So, for those who are new to these concepts, could you provide a brief and simple explanation of what operator theory is? And maybe you can connect it to Hilbert spaces and explain what that is also. Yeah, uh, since you have some uh, idea about linear algebra, imagine a matrix, but the matrix is infinite. You are already in the operator theory real. Because once you are playing with infinite, you know infinite, uh, I have to talk a little bit about that in order to explain uh, this. Infinite is a transcendental mathematical object. It does not exist in this universe. Our universe is finite. And only the human mind is actually making the connection with infinity. And as we teach our students, there is not only one infinity, there is a scale of infinities. And what is even worse, there is no such a thing as the largest infinity, which is a, 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 a source of discontent for many students when they realize that there is no such a thing as the largest infinite cardinal number. They say, come on, how this is possible? Okay, now let us come back to operator theory. So you have to imagine infinite matrices. Finite matrices, they act on uh, vector spaces of finite dimension. But 
infinite matrices x on vector spaces of infinite dimensions. And if you have already infinite dimensions, then you need analysis. Linear algebra is not sufficient. So you need limits, you need convergence, you need topology, you need all things. So operator theory, it's a wonderful combination between linear algebra and mathematical analysis. I can see the others, but I can't see the connection with topology really. How does that connect to these ideas? Because infinite space is topological? Are you yes, saying? yes. You, you, you need a topology. If you don't have a topology on an infinite dimension space, there is nothing you can do. Imagine that you have to sum up infinitely many vectors, and you need the, the concept of convergence. What does it mean, summing infinitely many elements? Yeah. So, uh, operators, as far as I know from what I know in physics, is used a lot in quantum mechanics, and some of your work seems to be about Hilbert spaces, as we have talked. That quantum mechanics plays a bit. Are you also interested in quantum mechanics? and? Uh, so, why not study about physics, but in mathematics about that part? Part of my research is um, about uh, mathematical physics, how we call it, but probably I have to explain this term. And um, most of the applications are in quantum physics, um, either closed system or open systems. In open systems you have evolution, you have more complicated objects. Uh, now, uh, in order to uh, make clear our definitions, okay, there is physics. Physics is a natural science. You have very sp uh, specific goals, you have very specific tools. Mathematics is something very abstract. My idea is that it is somewhere, we have no idea where it is. And in between there is mathematical physics, which means what? Physics performed with mathematical rigor. And there are many mathematicians that are working in this, and there are some of the physicists that are working here. But there is a whole chain between mathematical physics and laboratory physics. There is a whole chain of people. For instance, if you give me an article in physics, I may not understand it. But if I find an article in mathematical physics that explains the idea from physics, I can try to solve the problems in mathematics. And this is what, you, what I'm doing. So in quantum mechanics, you we work in Hilbert spaces that have infinite dimensions. Uh, and it comes back to like finite energy somehow from those. How, how do you explain that connection from going infinite to three-dimensional or four-dimensional, maybe five, but finite dimensions. Yeah, uh, the magic word here is the word spectrum. And there's a very nice story about spectrum. Spectrum first appears in physics, especially in the research by the end of the 19th century about radioactivity. Because you probably know this experiment, uh, you are uh, building uh, a body with some radiation, and then you have a sensitive screen behind it. And then there, there are some stripes that are there. And, um, okay, and they call it spectrum, which is very nice because spectrum, it's a synonym for ghost. Okay, uh, spectrum in mathematics was coined by David Hilbert. But he, he has given name spectrum to a mathematical concept apparently without relation with the spectrum from physics. But you see, what was wonderful was that eventually it was proven that they are the same. So it's a very strange coincidence. Okay, if we talk about the spectrum, and if you take it, if you have a linear operator in an infinite dimensional different space, assume that your operator has some symmetry properties like uh, it is symmetric or self-adjoint. Self-adjoint is a little bit more demanding. But anyhow, and you are looking at eigenvalues. In infinite dimension, uh, eigenvalues can be so uh, packed uh, one to each other that you don't distinguish. But 
if there are some conditions, for instance, you are taking a Schrodinger operator with a potential which is nice, then the set of eigenvalues of this uh, linear operator, which is modeling the Schrodinger operator with uh, potential, is a finite number of positive numbers that are accumulating to plus infinity. And these are exactly the energy levels in your quantum system. And they are discrete, so they are separated. That's why we have all this uh, picture of the, of the atom and of the levels of electrons and everything is governed by the Schrodinger equation. So uh, there is a discontinuity in energy levels, as, as you have mentioned. There is a spectrum of energy levels. Um, since uh, we don't observe that in um, non-bound systems, yeah. what does that mean? Are there a small discontinuity there too, do you think? Or is, is it continuous? If... This is one of the most difficult problems in mathematics. <laughs> we have we have mathematical models using these infinite dimensional objects, like operator theory in Hilbert spaces. But if you want to make a simulation on a computer, or you want to understand it properly, you have to somehow truncate it. So in, I'm, I'm going back to this idea. Imagine an infinite dimensional matrix. You have to truncate it to finite dimensional matrices. But the question is, where do you stop with truncation in such a way that you are not uh, missing some important parts. And this is where, where mathematical analysis uh, is needed, because you are talking about approximation theory. So the limits, how you have the behavior at the limit. Or you have the scattering theory. You are bombarding a body with some electrons, they come into it, and then they are reflected. You are getting a lot of information by just looking what is happening at minus infinity and plus infinity points with these electrons. And thank you for the answer. It clear, clear some stuff on it. So, um, I see that you have some papers about machine learning as well. Um, what do you think about the current development and do you have any prediction on when AGI will happen? This is a very uh, nice question, and there are a lot of uh, articles nowadays about. Uh, about yes. Um, I, I have to start saying that I know, I'm, not, I'm not a specialist in artificial intelligence yeah. or even in machine learning, but I'm using uh, my knowledge from, uh, especially from operator theory and um, more precisely uh, this reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces technique, which I use in order to solve some of the questions in machine learning, but from the point of view of mathematician, because nowadays artificial intelligence and machine learning is more an engineering domain, yeah. what uh, they do there. But this is usually the uh, development of a domain. First, our people interested in applications are coming, and then mathematicians that want to clarify theoretical parts of it. Coming back to your question, um, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm again uh, applying to a metaphor. There is this nice uh, question. You have a brick. What can you do with the brick? Some people say, I can build a building. But some other people can say, I can kill a man. So there are everything. Or take a knife. What can you do with a knife? You can cook a wonderful dish. Or you can injure somebody or you can kill somebody. It depends how you are using that tool. Um, the problem is that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a very powerful tool. And we have no idea what will be the consequences of it. Because, okay, we are living in a, in a, on a planet, on the planet Earth, which is full of uh, wars. Uh, states that are uh, coming over other states and killing people, and you never know about this. And but this is not the only point 
the point is that we realized uh, dramatically in the last years that the resources of our planet are now in danger. We are damaging our planet. I'm trying to make another comparison. Okay, back in the 50s, uh, engineers, chemist engineers, were excited about producing these plastic things. And they said, okay, they will make our lives better and easier. But now, we have in the uh, Pacific uh, Ocean, an island, large as a continent, with plastic. We have in our body microplastic, and we don't know what this will happen. So, we never know what will be actually the consequences of using artificial intelligence and machine learning. It will be for good, it will be for not that good purposes. So what would you say? Um, no, before, before that question, I just wanted to ask this. You mentioned the mind connecting the universes. So where do you, how do you think AGI does this? Do you think it has a mind, first of all, and if it has a mind, does it also connect this, this both universes in your consistent universe? Uh, well, I think that um, we have to make precise uh, what artificial intelligence is, because I'm afraid that we have different definitions. <laughs> okay, my definition is the current machine learning systems that try to optimize for a given specific task. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is a good definition. Let's assume that no, you don't have this. Do you think that could produce a mind? Uh, well, I'm coming back to another question. What is a mind? You compare with a human mind because a computer is also a mind. Okay. Definition for that that I will present is subjective experience. Just having colors, having having. A subjective experience. Yeah, uh, I'm optimistic about that. You know, there is also a, a domain of mathematics uh, which interests me. It's referring to mathematization of art, visual art. And if you go into that mathematics, you are going to see that it's very close of uh, artificial intelligence because uh, art is supposed to be creativity, a lot of creativity. But creativity is coming from where? It's coming from past experience, and it's coming from the possibilities of the system that is involved in that creativity. In our case, can be a human being, but what about making a computer become an artist? And it is possible, but the problem is the following. Most of the applications from artificial intelligence and machine learning, I have seen, they are doing what? Their performance is related to uh, being very efficient in uh, digging into very large amount of data and structuring and extracting from it something that can make a structure similar. But I don't see much creativity here. Because what they are doing is that they are all only reorganizing existing data. Yeah. Yeah, but still, we, we as humans can be doing that also without knowing it, you know. And that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a possibility at first. And second of all, uh, artificial intelligence doesn't seem to does seem to create some stuff, like when you, even now, when you give a prompt to GPT-4, for example, it can give an idea of how to approach a mathematical question that nobody may, may not have told. You know, that, that requires some creativity, and maybe creativity can be learned from previous data as well. Well, if uh, everything we do is about uh, the information that we already have, I couldn't call this creativity, I would call it just reorganizing the information. It certainly doesn't feel like we are doing computation, but do, do, do you think, can it, can't it be unconscious? Well, we're coming to another question, what is conscious? Um, yeah, yeah. 
Yes, that's so very we, hard to define. We are not quite specialized yeah. <laughs> about for sure. that. For sure. So, okay, since you have talked about the consequences, I will ask this one. Uh, Max Tegmark, Elon Musk, and other famous um, innovator scientists try to halt the development for at least six months. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it, and do you have any worries? As you mentioned, you do have worries, but what is your what worries you the most? And do you have any arguments for halting development? Um, I agree with uh, with that. There should be an agreement between all the states uh, about that, because as I said, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a very powerful uh, tool. It can happen like with a, with an atomic bomb or a nuclear bomb. They have been created, they have been used. But when we realized what devastating consequences they have, they made an, they made an agreement on, on this. So, okay, again, I may be old-fashioned, but I think that uh, things should be controlled. There are a lot of ethical issues about this. And unfortunately, they can be used uh, for worse. Would you um, go into a team that try to research uh, AI safety, for example? Do you? Uh, I'm not qualified for that. I may contribute with some ideas, but I'm afraid I'm not qualified, and I know my boundaries. <laughs> yeah, sure. Being common is really, really good on these topics because it, it's really, really is important. But do you think it will be done? Will they, will they be successful in the mission of halting the development, or do you think it will just... I don't think so. I don't think... I'm thinking about China. <laughs> <laughs> but even in nuclear stuff, and even cloning, they seem to have stopped, at least seem to. Yeah, but they have some reason about cloning. Yeah. Uh, okay, with a nuclear bomb, uh, I think it was a technology. Uh, barrier they uh, they got, um, but with artificial intelligence, uh, I'm afraid that there are no boundaries. Do you have any growing intuition of what can be the good ideas in AI safety? Safety? Are you considering that? I'm afraid I'm not qualified. For yeah. I have some ideas. If you want, I can I can share, but I don't think that they will work. It's very difficult to control at this level. And since there are these states, look at the, at the pandemic we had. They never accepted that they made terrible mistakes by, by not communicating to us. So I'm afraid they are going to do the same thing. So uh, do you think that, for example, OpenAI should open source the AI code? or? Uh, well, now you are coming to a question which is related to the old Pythagorean, Pythagorean school, okay. if you know. So the idea of the Pythagorean school it, it was that we have a lot of knowledge, but we don't share with the other people, because we don't want it to be used in the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's almost impossible. It's not it's almost impossible to control. Sure. Okay. And so... Uh, you have a paper with the title Bifurcation in the Evolution of Uncertainty in a Small Decision-Making Group by Consensus. First of all, a uh, fascinating title, but can you explain, explain the title the first and how is it working with a loved one in an academic paper? Yeah, you're talking about the joint paper I have with my daughter. Yeah. She's a sociologist, a researcher in sociology. It's specialized in decision theory, how people take decision. And uh, to explain the title, the problem was the following. Uh, imagine that you have a group of uh, people that have to decide upon uh, an issue. Now, uh, recently, the idea is not to take the decision by voting majority, but by consensus. And consensus means negotiation and exchange of information. So, um, after learning about this problem, uh, we were able to provide a mathematical model, which is a dynamical uh, system. 
And my uh, collaborated, uh, collaborator had an experiment with uh, 100 students, a lot of uh, things, and we collected the data, and we checked our mathematical model with the data, and we got a lot of, uh, a lot of information and a lot of uh, interesting results. And to explain the word bifurcation, this is happening because the dynamical system, see, since you are a student in physics, you know that uh, some dynamical systems are chaotic. They can evolve in unpredictable ways. And we discovered the bifurcation in the dynamical system. So people can act in very strange way in this, uh, in this uh, taking a decision group uh, by consensus. So uh, still the question remains, how, how was the I was working with a lot. Oh, it was a wonderful experience, yeah. Because, uh, actually, I learned a lot. As I said, I'm a very curious person, and I always want to learn from the other people, and especially in social sciences, there's a lot of things I'm not aware of, uh, of it, and I learned. And one of the things I learned, and my daughter explained it, that communication is extremely important. And, there are some research about uh, communication, and what they say is that if there is a kind of affinity between the person that are, communication, are communicating, the communication is uh, doing much better. So I have a wonderful communication with, uh, with her. That's very nice. That, that seems to be like hard for a mathematician because, because there's no a social insight. But how was it like growing your mind for you? <laughs> yeah, because I took care about her education. So she had a good, uh, a good uh, background in mathematics. She actually has a background in, in many others. She's probably one of the most multidimensional person I have seen. So uh, she has a, a degree in sociology, a master in social measurements in England. A, a PhD, half in Germany, half in Romania, but she's also a musician. Um, she is playing violin and piano, and she also sings, and she's also composing, and she has a degree in uh, fine arts, in sculpture, and uh, she also has a minor in uh, electrical engineering. <laughs> so, uh, to answer your question, uh, her mathematics is good, so we can communicate because she understands uh, mathematics. Okay, very cool. So uh, I missed I missed that part, but uh, how did you s s decide on coming here to Turkey and leaving your family? Um, after spending twenty years in a research institute, I I decided that uh, something is missing and. What is missing is uh, teaching students. Uh, unfortunately, getting a position in a university in Romania was not uh, that easy for me because of some, some things. And so I applied internationally. I applied in different countries. And uh, the thing was that at that time, the Department of Mathematics uh, of Birken University was uh, looking for a mathematician specialized in analysis. And uh, I was invited here, I had a seminar talk, uh, they made an offer for me. Actually, I was very pleased after coming here to see uh, Birken University, which is indeed wonderful. Even in the world, there are not many universities having uh, this campus life. And actually, something that I like very much here, and that was um, an observation of my wife after coming here, she said, you finally got your ivory tower. Because here, I don't need to do anything but just doing my arithmetic, teaching students. I'm enjoying the sport facilities. I enjoy, I'm a music lover. I enjoy the symphonic orchestra. <laughs> And I enjoy the campus. Uh, another hobby of mine is trekking in the mountains. So I go to Kuzir Jahamam and trek in the Soksu Park. And <laughs> yeah, 
So you love it here? Still. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, very nice. Good to know. Thank you. So, what are some of the most important or recent breakthroughs in the field of operator theory, Hilbert spaces? Um, and how do these developments impact your work and the broader mathematical community that you have? Uh, there are a lot of uh, very nice uh, results. Okay, there are some big problems, open problems in operator theory which are not yet solved. One of them is a problem of invariant subspaces. And unfortunately, there is no much hope of uh, getting it. But there are some other. My domain is between operator theory and operator algebras, and operator algebras are closer to quantum physics. And actually, uh, my PhD was in spectral theory. So, uh, uh, but I specialized for about twenty years into uh, a theory which is called the operator theory on indefinite inner product spaces, and this is very much connected with quantum field theory, because um, to give an idea what an uh, indefinite inner product space is, imagine a Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. In which the inner product is not positive definite. It can take negative and positive values, like in the Minkowski space. So you have a cone, the cone light, and then you have some uh, manifolds which are crossing the cone light. And then there are a lot of degeneracy and a lot of things happening. And actually, if I'm talking about my achievements, um, last year I succeeded uh, publishing uh, my book. Uh, Cambridge University, which um, uh, somehow gathers my work for about 30 years and gathers the most important uh, results in this theory. It took me, uh, it took about 10 years from my life in order to finish it. And I'm very happy I did it because at some moments I was, um, I was oscillating. I was not sure I, I, I can finish it. So how many years more? Could you have done like 15? When would you have to stop it? 15 years, 20 years? When? How do you know when to give up? Uh, actually, uh, in this, uh, the pandemic played a role. Because when the pandemic started, I realized how vulnerable I am. Uh, my, I had material for about uh, 700 pages, and then I said, okay. I was, I was not very happy about it, so every time there was something I had to make, so my project was too ambitious. And then I decided, okay, I have to remove everything which is not in a complete matter, because this book contains uh, about one, one third of the book is uh, represented by my own uh, results, and uh, two thirds are from other mathematicians, and I said, okay, I have to to stop the book here, I have to eliminate everything which is not complete, and I have to reorganize it and make it publishable, and that's what I did. So, who is the book for, and how was the process of writing it? It took ten years. Ten years. Yeah, but I'm um, I'm I'm a probably a strange mathematician. I'm always changing, reorganizing, putting things in a different perspective. I heard about a new result. I wanted to incorporate it in mine, so then I had to change. So that's why I'm saying even about my other uh, activities of writing, uh, nothing is definite for me until the last moment. Did you consider like um, publishing a lot of books with similar content? Because you, you probably had a lot of variation in books. Yeah, but no, 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 like that. No. Maybe more tours of an independent. No, history. I have, I have in my mind another book. If I will be healthy and live long enough, I hope I can finish it. And th this is referring exactly to reproducing kernel spaces, which is a fascinating domain. So it will gather my results in the last uh, twenty years plus additional results of other. Did you ever see an ambitious, you probably have seen ambitious mathematicians, but I'm talking about a bad ambitious, you know, trying to bring you down rather than 
working together. Yeah, unfortunately, there are these kind of people. Why do you think that is? Because it's it's really hard hard work to go in mathematics, and if you want to do that, you really have to put into your heart. But those people that seem to believe those principles by heart. Yeah, but you you know we are living in a competitive world, and uh, that was something I uh, I got from my son. My son is graduated management here in Vienna. Now he is uh, a corporatist in uh, Switzerland in uh, general, and he explained to me uh, this. You know, in business, everything is about money. In science, in academia, it's not about money, it's about ego, it's about fame, it's about these kind of things. So people somehow are fighting for these kind of things. And okay, they see somebody that is more successful and they become jealous, they become and behave nasty. But this is in the human nature. You can't seem to get rid of them. But um, what would you change in, like, how can fame not play a role in these academic parts? It depends on your personality. Yeah, but still, if academia didn't ever brought fame to anyone, would that solve the problem? Probably. But ah, one, uh, one idea is that all the results we obtain will be anonymous, yeah? Yeah. No author. Yeah. Okay, but I don't think that is possible because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm giving the example in this university, something that students probably are not aware of. As a professor, we are evaluating according to two different um, aspects of our academic life. One is research, the other is teaching. So we are paid for our teaching, but we are evaluating according to our research. And there is, there is a pressure, publish more, publish in higher reputed journals. And um, everything is depending on that. So we are, we are evaluated with this, uh, with this criterion. And then some people behave, okay, you probably know, not here in Lincoln because here is an elite university, but there are other universities where there is either a problem with plagiarism and a lot of bad behavior. So the criterion might be changed and optimized maybe to fix those problems. Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, there is a problem because now uh, uh, <laughs> there is a domain, they call it Scientology, <laughs> in which they want to put numbers for the early research achievements. Yeah. And this is sometimes almost impossible. Yeah. So they are exactly. judging actually, yeah, the articles not according to their value, but according to uh, the rank of the journal or the rank of the publisher, if you write a book, and it's complicated. Do you think AI could help about that, since it understands human and processes a lot of data best? It may, or it may make things worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, it's consequences are unpredictable, I guess. Uh, so, we talked about the book a little bit, but uh, you mentioned some problems, but what are the other problems that you encountered while writing the book? Any, any problems in publication, maybe? No, I had a very good collaboration with Scandinavian University Press, and they were, and I'm really thankful for them. Uh, it took about one year after I considered it to be definite. Uh, it went through uh, to the hands of three copy editors, and I had to make a lot of changes. But that was, that was very good. So they helped. They really helped in improving the presentation of uh, of the. No, no, it was very smooth uh, collaboration. Why writing the book? How, how much are you trying to give visual examples and how do you balance those things because it's, it's not easy? Visual examples is difficult. Okay, it has some, some graphics, some pictures, but they are more mathematical objects. Than, and Since you work on in-depth 
it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's really difficult yeah. to fix your shit. Yeah. So, do you think you have balanced that, or could that could that have been improved? Uh, it could be better. No, I, I'm never happy about the final <laughs> result. But as I said, uh, being a perfectionist is not a good attitude. At some moment, you have to put a stop. Say this is it. Let it go. So, what do you think future holds for research in operator theory, hermitian kernels, reproducing kernels that you work on? Are there any emerging trends? You may you mentioned one, but any other ones or open problems that you find particularly exciting? Yeah, but uh, since I'm now um, approaching the end of my career, I'm already 68, and um, um, I'm aware that I don't probably have many years left to uh, be able to work on these projects. So I'm giving the optimistic 10 more years, if everything is okay. Um, my philosophy is a little bit diff different. I'm more interested in unification. Probably as a student in physics, you'll be more uh, excited about that. Because there are some results in operator theory and operator algebra which seems a little bit unrelated. And I was successful in the last 20 years to get some, let us call umbrella, which contains all of them as particular cases. And this is what we call a unification. So now these are my main problems in, in, in my domain that I'm considering. Very nice. So your future work will be about those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after your retirement, what are you considering besides of? I will do mathematics as long as I can do it. <laughs> very, very cool. So you you mentioned that you have others like you are multidisciplinary also. I guess what 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 do you do else? I'm interested in art, in different art. I'm interested in music very much. Um. Okay, I'm quite an amateur in playing classical guitar. I love trekking in the mountains, so after uh, retire, retiring from here, I will go back to Romania, and we have a lot of wonderful mountains. Probably I will never be able to, <laughs> to trek in all of them. And I will also dedicate my, my life to other, uh, to other things. Uh, I am a member of an organization which is uh, Concerned about ecological issues, about deforestation in my country, about uh, garbage uh, treatment, they are not doing it properly. So, probably I will dedicate my life to these kind of activities. Okay, very nice. So, uh, you mentioned about communism in your country. Um, how, what were the wrong parts of that, in your opinion? Because I, I didn't grow up in a communist country, so I would like to know. Communism as an ideology looks very appealing. For instance, I'm a vegetarian. I'm every week going to use on Julian Pazel, which is just uh, next to Metro University. And sometimes I'm seeing their students from Metro, and they have a journal, uh, a journal of the Communist Party in, in Turkey, and they try to <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> and I enter into conversations with these young guys, and I say, guys, you have no idea what is communism, because it looks wonderful, but implemented, it's a hell. Believe me, it was a hell in my country, he said, especially in the last 10 years. I was married, I had two children. I had, uh, during the winter, I had a temperature of 15 degrees in my apartment. We couldn't find food for our children. We couldn't uh, find basic things, and it was horrible. And that's why, in December 1989, I was on the street risking my life in the, in the revolution in order to overthrow all this enemy. Fortunately, we have been successful, but we paid a terrible cost, more than 1,000. People, most of them young, like you died. Very, very difficult. Right. 
sorry I need to go to. So thank you very much for your work, for you coming here. Thank you very much for being here. So this will be the end of our podcast and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank thank you very much for the questions. Thank you.